Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons, Chapter 3. Dawn crept over the downs like a sinister white animal, followed by the snarling cries of a wind eating its way between the black boughs of the thorns. The wind was the furious voice of this sluggish animal, of the sluggish animal light that was bearing the dormers and mullions and scullions of Cold Comfort Farm. The farm was crouched on a bleak hillside, whence its fields, fanged with flints, dropped steeply to the village of Howling a mile away. Its stables and outhouses were built in the shape of a rough octangle surrounding the farmhouse itself, which was built in the shape of a rough triangle. The left point of the triangle abutted on the farthest point of the octangle, which was formed by the cow sheds, which lay parallel with the big barn. The outhouses were built of a rough cast stone, with thatched roofs, while the farm itself was built partly of local flint set in cement, and partly of some stone brought as great trouble and enormous personal expense from Perthshire. The farmhouse was a long, low building, two-storied in parts. Other parts of it were three-storied. Edward the Sixth had originally owned it in the form of a shed, in which he housed his swine herds, but he had grown tired of it and it had to rebuild in Sussex clay. And it had it rebuilt in Sussex clay. Then he pulled it down. Elizabeth had rebuilt it, with a good many chimneys in one way and another. The Charleses had let it alone, but William and Mary had pulled it down again, and George I had rebuilt it. George II, however, burned it down. George III added another wing. George IV pulled it down again. By the time England had to develop that magnificent blossoming trade of imperial expansion, which fell to her under her which fell to her under lot which fell to her lot under Victoria, there was not much of the original building left, save the tradition that it had always been there. It crouched like a beast about to spring under the bulk of Mock Uncle Hill, like ghosts embedded in brick and stone, the architectural variations of each period through which it had passed were were mute history. It was known locally as the King's Whim. The front door of the farm faced a perfectly inaccessible plowed field at the back of the house. It had been the whim of Red Rolig Starkadder in 1835 to have it so, and so the family always used to come in by the back door, which abutted on the general yard facing the cow sheds. A long corridor ran half through the, the house on the second story and then stopped. One could not get into the attics at all, it was all very awkward, growing with some viscous light that was invading the sky. There came the solemn, tortured snake voice of the sea two miles away, falling in sharp folds upon the mirror expanses of the beach. Under the ominous bowl of the sky, a man was plowing the sloping field immediately below the farm, where the flints shone bone-sharp and white in the growing light. The ice cascade of the wind leaped over him as he guided his pl the plow, over the flinty runnels. Now and again he called roughly to his team. Up a day, Traval! Oh, there, arsenic! Jump, jump! But for the most part he worked in silence. And silent were his team. The light showed no more in his face than a gray expanse of flesh, expressionless as the land he plowed, from which looked out two sluggish eyes. Every now and again when he came to the corner of the field and was forced to tilt the scramlet of his plow almost on its axle to make the turn, he glanced up at the farm where it squatted like where it squatted on the gaunt shoulder of the hill, and something like a possessive gleam shone in his dull eyes. But he only turned his team again, watching the crooked passage of the scantlet through the yeasty earth, and muttered, Ola, Arsnick, belay that travail well, the bitter light wand into full day. Because of the peculiar formation of the outhouses surrounding the farm, the light was always longer in reaching the yard than the rest of the house. Long after the sunlight was shining through the cobwebs on the uppermost windows of the old house, the yard was in damp blue shadow. It was in shadow now, but sharp gleams sprang from the ranged milk buckets along the forward piece outside the cowshed, leaving the house by the back door you came up sharply against a stone wall, running right across the yard and turning abruptly at right angles just before it reached the shed where the bull was housed, and running down to the gate 
leading out into the ragged garden, where mallows, dog's body, and wild turnip were running riot. The bull shed abutted upon the right corner of the dairy, which faced the cow sheds. The cow sheds faced the house, but the back door faced the bull's shed. From here, a long roofed barn extended the whole length of the octangle until it reached the front door of the house. Here it took a quick turn and ended. The dairy was, aw was awkwardly placed. It had been a thorn in the side of old Fig Starkadder, the last owner of the farm, who had died three years ago. The dairy overlooked the front door. In face of extreme point of the triangle, which formed the ancient building of the farmhouse. From the dairy, a wall extended, which formed the right-hand boundary of the octangle, joining the bull shed and the pig pens at the extreme end of the right point of the triangle. A staircase put in to make it more difficult ran parallel with the octangle, halfway around the yard against the wall which led down to the garden gate. The spurt and regular ping of milk against metal came from the reeking interior of the sheds. The bucket was pressed between Adam Lambert's knees, and his head was pressed deep into the flank of Feckless, the big jersey. His gnarled hands mechanically stroked the teeth, while a low, crooning mindless as the downwind itself came from his lips. He was asleep. He had been awake all night, wandering in thought over the indifferent bare shoulders of the downs, after his wild bird, his little flower, Elphine, or Elphine, the name unspoken, but sharply musical as a glittering bead shaken from a fountain's tossing necklace hovered audibly in the rancid air of the shed. The beasts stood with heads lowered dejectedly against the wooden hoop, hoop pieces of their stalls. Graceless, pointless, feckless, and aimless awaited their turn to be milked. Sometimes, aimless ran her dry tongue with a rasping sound as sharp as a file through silk awkwardly across the bony flank of feckless which was still moist with the rain that had fallen upon it through the roof during the night, or pointless turned her large, dull eyes sideways as she swung her head upward to tear down a mouthful of cobwebs from the wooden runnet above her head, a, low a lowering, moist, steamy light, almost like that which gleams below the eyelids of a man in fever, filled the cowshed. Suddenly, a tortured bellow, a blaring welter of sound that shattered the quiescence of the morning tore its way across the yard and died away in a croak that was almost a sob. It was big business, the bull, waking to another day in the clammy darkness of his cell. The sound woke Adam. He lifted his head from the flank of Feckless and looked around him in bewilderment for a moment. Then, slowly his eyes, which looked small and wet and lifeless in his primitive face, lost their terror as he realized that he was in the cowshed, that it was half-past six on a winter morning, and that his gnarled fingers were about the task which they had performed at this hour in this place for the past eighty years and more. He stood up, sighed, and crossed over to Pointless, who was eating Graceless's tail. Adam, who was linked to all dumb brutes by a chain forged in soil and sweat, took it out of her mouth and put it into, instead, his neckerchief, the last he had. She mumbled it, and put into it instead his neckerchief, the last he had. She mumbled it while he milked her, but steadily spat it out as soon as he passed on to Aimless, and concealed it under the reeking straw with her hoof. She did not want to hurt the old man's feelings by declining his gift. There was a close bond, a slow, deep, primitive, silent, down-dragging link between Adam and all living beasts. They knew each other's simple needs. They lay close to the earth. And sometimes the earth's old fierce simplicities had seeped into their being. And something of the earth's old fierce simplicities had seeped into their being. Suddenly, a shadow fell athward the wooden stanchions of the door. Suddenly, a shadow fell athwart the wooden stanchions of the door. It was no more than a darkening of the pallid paws of the day, which were now embracing the shed. But all the cows instinctively stiffened, and Adam's eyes, as he stood up to face the newcomer, were again piteously full of twisted fear. Adam, uttered the woman who stood in the doorway, how many pails of milk will there be this morning? I dunna may, responded Adam cringingly. Tis hard to tell. If so be as our pointless has got over her indigestion, maybe it will be four. If so be she hasn't, maybe three. 
Judith Stark at her made an impatient movement. Her large hands had a quality which made them seem to sketch vast horizons with their slightest gesture. She looked a woman without boundaries as she stood, wrapped in a crimson shawl to protect her bitter, magnificent shoulders from the splintery cold of the early air. She seemed fitted for any stage, however enormous. Well, get as many buckets as you can, she said, lifelessly, half turning away. Mrs. Stark had her questioned me about the milk yesterday. She has been complaining all out she's been comparing our output with that from other farms in the district, and she says we are five sixteenths of a bucket below what our rate should be, considering how many cows we have. A strange film cast over Adam's eyes, giving him the lifeless primeval look that a lizard has, basking in the swooning southern heat, but he said nothing. And another thing, continued Judith, you will probably have to drive down to Beershorn tonight to meet a train. Robert Post's child is coming to stay with us for a while. I expect to hear some time this morning what time she's arriving. I will tell you later about it. Adam shrank back against the gangrened flank of Pointless. Mun I? he asked piteously. Mun I, Miss Judith? Oh, I don't send me. How can I look into her little flower face and me knowing what I know? Oh, Miss Judith, I beg of you not to send me. Besides, he added more practically, it's close on sixty-five years since I put a hand on a pair of reins, and I might upset the lady. Judith, who had slowly turned from him while, she, while he was speaking, was now halfway across the yard. She turned her head to reply to him. With a slow, graceful movement, her deep voice clanged like a bell in the frosty air. You must go, Adam. You must forget what you know, as we all must while she is here. As for the driving, you had best harness Viper to the trap and drive down into Howling and back six times this afternoon to get your hand in again. Could not Master Seth go instead of me? Emotion shook the frozen grief on her face. She said low and sharp, You remember what happened when he went to meet the new kitchen maid? No, you must go. Adam's eyes, little blind pools of water in his primitive face, suddenly grew cunning. He turned back to Aimless and resumed his mechanical stroking of the teat, saying in a sing-song rhythm, Ah, oh, then I'll go, Miss Judith. I've done a many times I've thought as how this day might come, and now I'm on go to bring Robert Post's child back to cold comfort. Ay, tis strange. They seed to the flowers, the seed to the flower, the flower to the fruit, the fruit to the belly, ay, so twill go. Judith had crossed the muck, and rabble of the yard, and now entered the house by the back door. In the large kitchen, which occupied most of the middle of the house, a sullen fire burned, the smoke of which wavered up the blackened walls and over the deal table, darkened by age and dirt, which was roughly set for a meal. A snood full of coarse porridge hung over the fire, and standing with one arm resting upon the high mantel, looking moodily down into the heavy contents of the snood, was a tall young man whose riding boots were splashed with mud to the thigh, and whose coarse linen shirt was open to his waist. The firelight lit up his diaphragm muscles as they heaved slowly and rough with it rhythm with the porridge. He looked up as Judith entered and gave a short, defiant laugh that said nothing. Judith slowly crossed over until she stood by his side. She was as tall as he. They stood in silence, she staring at him, and he down to the secret crevices of the porridge. "'Well, mother mine,' he said at last, "'here I am, you see.' I said I would be in time for breakfast, and I have kept my word. His voice had a low, throaty animal quality, a sneering warmth that wound a velvet ribbon of sexuality over the outward coarseness of this man. Judith's breath came in long shudders. She thrust her arms deeper into her shawl. The porridge gave an ominous, leering heave. It might almost have been endowed with life, so uncannily did its movements keep pace with the human passions that throbbed above it. And we will pause there.